the two wonderful guests we have this evening. Um, Colm Tobin, of course, is one of the great masters of contemporary prose. Um, his novels uh, are really marked by their, by their subtlety and their elegance, but also by their compassion, um, by their seriousness, and by their engagement with, with that deep sense of what it means to be alive in time, uh, in, in, in a particular time. Um, Roy Foster is uh, undoubtedly one of the great historians uh, of our era. Um, Roy is professor of Irish history, a Carroll professor of Irish history at Hartford College in, in Oxford. Um, his books uh, include what you would expect to find, I suppose, in, in, in many ways from a mainstream historian. His book, Modern Ireland, is um, both a seminal work and a standard work, and those two things don't often go together. But uh, looking at the, the work of both of these men, you find that um, they have clearly things on their CVs which would identify them um, as, as, as being within a certain kind of silo. Um, but then you look more closely and you see that they both have a much, much wider range of, of interest. Um, both of them are biographers. Um, Colm has written brilliantly about Lady Gregory. Um, his most recent book, it's quite hard to keep up with them sometimes, but the most recent book is um, not the wonderful recent novel uh, called Nora Webster, but uh, a new book on Elizabeth Bishop, which is imaginatively entitled On Elizabeth Bishop. <laughs> uh, novelists might have been able to do better than that, but... but um, and. Uh, if you look at uh, Roy's work, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the classical work of a historian, um, but he's never recognized that, that, uh, that history consists only of what people did. Um, he's always recognized that history is, is, is also about how people think and feel. Um, what kind of worldview do they bring to bear on their own times? Uh, and of course, Roy's, Roy's work um, has... Uh, ha has often taken him into the field of, of biography, um, which itself, of course, is the great field where you find this crossover between um, historical events and, and uh, the deeply intimate intricacies of personal lives. Um, most famously, of course, Roy is the official biographer of William Butler Yeats, uh, a magnificent two-volume uh, biography of Yeats. Uh, but also, very strikingly, um, Roy's new book, Vivid Faces, a portrait of a revolutionary generation, the revolutionary generation that created the contemporary Irish state, um, really breaks new ground in terms of the writing of Irish history by um, really taking right down to the core um, of individual lives, um, what, it, what it felt like to be alive at that time, uh, how this generation uh, thought about themselves, how they saw themselves, how they imagined themselves. And so this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book which um, brings together uh, the, um, the, the, the sense of the large world-shaping events that are surrounding these people uh, in their own time and the tiny little moments of individual ambition and imagination and idealism and folly and... and, and, and uh, um, self-obsession and all of, all of those kind of things that go into the making of a life that we would normally think of as the material of, of, of a novelist. Uh, the last thing, of course, that both of these writers share is that they're both um, extraordinary stylists. Uh, and we sometimes forget that the most obvious kind of crossover between the writing of history and writing of fiction is writing. Uh, they're both forms of writing. Um, and um, I don't think it's stretching things too far to say that Colum's prose has something of the stringency and care that you would expect from a historian. There's, a, there's a, a seriousness about every word and how it attaches to the truth of an individual uh, that really just marks the way he writes. And it's equally true to say, uh, on the other side, that, that Roy's work has um, the elegance, the stylistic individuality, um, the sense of the writing process itself as being part of the way in which a book is constructed, uh, which you would expect of a novelist. 
Um, so hopefully after that long preamble, they have a lot to say to each other, um, but they don't turn around. So actually, no, that's true. Um, but Roy, I might begin with you, if you don't mind. Um, and let me just start with that perception that people have really about the writing of history, that, that uh, history has been dominated by the large scale, by, by the sense of trying to imagine the long-term forces that are shaping individual destinies. Um, and of course, nobody can ignore any, any of those things. But in your own work, there's always been this very strong sense of the individual life. And it really comes to a kind of fruition in, in, in the new book, because you're looking at a generation, but not a generation in an abstract sense, but a generation in the sense of, of, of who these people might have been and how they might have seen themselves. Yeah, thanks, Fintan. I'd, I'd really just like to go on listening to Fintan all night. <laughs> But now I'll, That's only because I'm saying nice things about you. Exactly, right? now I'll proceed to, dis, to, to disappoint you. Um, yeah, I suppose when I began to study history, I guess in the 1960s, seriously, it was a matter of large frameworks and of almost ideological templates that were fitted to experience, national experience. And, you know, we were reading books, books by people like Fernand Brodel and Eric Hobsbawm, which did this. And I suppose what turned my mind was a little later reading Theodore Zeldin's work on France, two wonderful volumes called, you know, so a history, the Oxford University History of France. And then you looked at the subtitles, volume one, Intellect, Taste, and Anxiety, volume two, Love, Ambition, and Politics. And I thought, gosh, maybe it could be about what you just said, about how people feel and think, as well as what they do. And I suppose the general history I myself wrote not long after that attempted to look a bit at that. And more and more, I've moved into writing what, what my wife says is my novel, in fact, rather sarcastically. And I suppose, in a sense, this book uses some of the techniques of a novelist, but always grounding them uh, the, the, the insights, the quotations, in what people have actually said. I think it's very dangerous to infer feelings, which a certain kind of biographer does. And I think one should ground everything. My rather austere historical training has taught me that and nothing else. Colm, of course, is a trained historian, I have to add. So yes. when you say what you've said about him, I think what he brings to fiction is a historian's training. And so the crossover that you mentioned is happening there. But I also think that certainly in my case, and possibly in Collins as well, and it would be interesting to hear it, it's a matter of the age you live through. And the past 30 odd years, not only historians, but most people who operate in any kind of intellectual analysis have been moving away from certain imposed templates and patterns. And towards other more, perhaps more inferential ideas about the way history happens and the way people act and the way people are. Um, Colm, just taking up what Roy's been saying about your own work, I mean, it, 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 it always occurs to me when I read your own, your, your novels particularly, that at the back of them is the sort of the notion that the, the personal is political, but also that the political is highly personal, that, that you, you never, you haven't written a novel which doesn't have a sense of public events weighing somewhere on the lives of the people, um, even if they themselves are not particularly conscious of them. But uh, I mean, how much of that, Roy mentions you have this training as a historian, and, and how much of that feeds into your creative process? Um, I was born on a battlefield, and I think that would help anyone, really, you know, if you wanted to, be, wanted to write. Um, in other words, that our house looked across the valley, and we could see Vinegar Hill, and that was where the last stand of the rebels in 1798 took place. And it's named in all the songs, as is the town of Enniscorthy, where, where, I, where, I'm, where I'm from. And, um, but also, that there, there was an acute consciousness in the town and certainly within my family and the friends of the family um, about the 1916 rebellion, which as we know took place in Dublin, Easter 1916, but the only other place, more or less, I mean there were one or two exceptions, but the only, the only big town that, that, as they say, rose up in 1916 was in Escorthy. 
And um, my grandfather took part in that. He was waiting for the he was waiting for the rebellion for a long time. He, he himself and his brother were diehards. In other words, they came out of Fenianism, and they would have done anything. I, I'm not aware of them having any social blueprint. I mean, it wasn't as though they wanted a, a sort of social revolution. They wanted the Brits out of Ireland, and they would have done anything to cause that, join any movement, and they did. And he took part in the rebellion and was interned in Frongoch in Wales. Um, afterwards, that they were slightly alarmed when they arrived in Wales to find that they couldn't understand their guards because they were speaking English, being good Irishmen. Of course, their guards were speaking Welsh. And that was a sort of irony that wasn't lost on them. Um, but, but, the, but, but the thing that mattered and the, the, the issue that Roy's book has helped me clear up to some extent, but it still remains a puzzle, is um, so the rebellion took place Easter. Um, the town of Enniscorthy was quickly pacified. A number of the leaders were sentenced to death. One of the men sentenced to death was called Seamus Doyle. Now, we lived in number nine of this uh, housing estate, and he lived in number 21. And um, he looms rather large in my childhood because he was the only person I knew who had been sentenced to death. But he was also, of course, he had a rose garden, which you know, was a nightmare because if you kicked a ball into his rose garden, you would obviously do something to his roses, and he was the crankiest old fellow. I don't know, being sentenced to death must have just... Well, it didn't encourage good humour in him. <laughs> and um, my mother lived in slight dread of him, as did my father's older brother, Uncle Tom, who was a sort of fun-loving person, because Seamus Doyle, who, who'd been sentenced to death, he would arrive in the house, and I'm not making this up, he would say to my father, I was looking at something the other day, some book, and it said that St. Patrick came to Ireland in 431. Now, I always thought it was 432. <laughs> and my father would get involved and say, I know what you mean, that it's, the, it's in the format, you know, in the various sources. And my mother just said, one night, Uncle Tom just stood up and said, hey, boys, I'll leave you to it. Like, I'm going. And she said to her, I don't know how you put up with those two. Like, I don't know what. But being sentenced to death, um, so... Um, Sounds when, like he deserved it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but it was really hard to imagine him as a young revolutionary because he'd, been cut, he'd become a very conservative old man. Um, his wife um, was one of the three women who put the flag up over the, the other one. One of the others was the mother of Mae Brennan, the novelist, who would then make, him, make her the grand aunt of Roddy Doyle, the novelist, um, Una Brennan. Una Brennan and two other women put the flag up over one of the main buildings of the town on Easter Monday, 1916. The third one was called Marion Stokes. And in 1966, when Irish television was showing a series called Insurrection, which is a drama documentary about the rebellion. She had no television. And um, she came to the house and sat with us as we watched happening an event that she had taken part in. And it was 50 years afterwards. So she, I don't know, she didn't seem that old. And she was certainly compass mantis, and she was following it. And we, we just took this, all, all this relationship between the rebellion and us almost as perfectly normal. The thing that I don't understand that I was referring to that Roy's book helped me with is what happened then in Enniscorthy was the following week the Urban District Council met and um, they, were, they were not an unusual group they were all elected and they passed a motion they just passed one motion at the meeting they wanted to condemn the rising in every possible way and congratulate the British military for the action they had taken against these dreadful people and that was it was unanimously passed and it went on the books when my uncle got on to be town clerk in Enniscorthy in 1940-something, he cut out that page and destroyed it because it, it would soiled the memory of Enniscorthy forever into history. So that's, that's, luckily that disappeared. But the, the other thing that happened was when my grandfather was released from prison and they came back into the town in some sort of triumph on, um, on Christmas Eve 1916. In other words, they were there from April to December. Um, he, never, he, he never got a job again. He, he could not be employed. Nobody wanted him around. And the only person I've ever heard talk about this is the president of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, who has written poems about his father, who never worked, having taken part in the rebellion in rural Ireland, once he went back into rural Ireland, was never allowed work again. So when I, when I look at how 1916 moves to 1918, and the landslide victory for those who had supported the rebellion in late 1918, the, the first time I came across any doubt that it was caused by the rebellion itself, in other words, the leaders of the rebellion were executed. Somehow or other, it is said, 
historians have said and other people have said that public opinion changed as it were overnight one moment they're against the rebellion and the next moment something else has occurred a terrible beauty has been born it's in lady gregory's letters she thinks there should be executions but then when the executions occur she's she's shattered by them and her mind is changed by them but in roy's in, in roy foster's modern ireland he just wonders if this could possibly be fully true and wonders if the threat of conscription which was loom uh, you know, there was no conscription in ireland in, in in the first world war but it was looming in other words they were threatening it you can just imagine that going into 1917 after the battle of the somme with with it being threatened that that could change public opinion pretty quickly if you thought your johnny you know was about to be sent off to, to you know to france and um but the book um vivid faces because it's a portrait of a generation and it attempts to suggest that, that, the, that the roots of the rebellion occurred in the personal lives of its leaders, in the way they loved, in the way they danced, in the way they wrote letters to each other, in the way they mixed together in a city. In other words, in other words they were a generation, not merely a generation who fought in a revolution, but a generation who sought something new in their lives, and the revolution was part of that. That, that therefore, their, their, their sort of roots in needing change went back very far. And therefore, the execution of the leaders had, had, had a very powerful effect because it was on a generation's hopes. It was on something much larger than the mere military business. And that has helped me to explain or understand that crucial period between Easter 1916 and the general election of 1918. But, uh, but, but again, I think you require a historian's imagination to be able, first of all, to take the myth asunder and the myth being that it was the executions themselves caused the change of opinion, if it is a myth, and then see what other things you can put in in its stead that make sense or some sense, remaining tentative. Um, Colin was talking about the, the, the book and the way it, it imagines a generation, and, and he actually used the phrase the historian's imagination, which I suppose is, is, uh, is pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, and I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about the, just the methodology of it, because um, you were using materials, I imagine, which nobody had ever used before or had used only very, very partially. Uh, and I, I just wondered, was, was that, did you almost have to invent a method to be a historian and at the same time to be dealing in, in people's very, in intimacies in many ways? You're talking about generational conflict between people and their parents. You're talking about sexuality. You're talking about theater and poetry and you know the, the way they 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 try to to be creative people it's not the sort of stuff that's that that is usually grounds down yeah. to make big history and i just wondered how you how you went about that it begins in biography i think george moore said everything begins in yates and ends in yates which is the thing that rings in my mind after spending 18 years writing about Yeats. and when i was spending those 18 years writing about yates i kept coming across letters to him from friends in the 20 odd years leading up to 1916 and noticing the way their opinions were changing noticing when they started signing their names in irish noticing when they begin not ridiculing the Sinn fein movement but writing about it with a certain first grudging respect and i thought the moment at when when things change is what i would like to try and and anatomize but to do it between to, to find out what's happening between people's ears before finding out what they do out in the world. And so I began looking for diaries and letters of people in that world over the 25 years leading up to 1916. And there was a, one of those epiphanic moments when I was reading the, the diary of a long forgotten Republican activist called Liam de Rochla in, in, in Cork. And he writes in 1905 that he has a feeling that things in Ireland are changing as he changes himself. I am changing and things around me change. He's 23 years old. He's a very clever but self-educated farmer's widow's son. He's working at night school. And he has a sense that the changes within himself are being replicated in society at large. And it was like a light had been turned on. Oh. And from that, I suppose, I knew my, my direction. Uh, and it was a matter of spending s nearly seven years accumulating this kind of thing and then these kind of reflections 
and then patterning them into the way individual lives were lived during a time of change, having to segue into, into narrative at a certain point to, to explain what's actually happening when rebels take over the center of Dublin for a week at Easter 1916 and a guerrilla war begins, but always concentrating on the people whose internal lives I'd been following. That's why I guess it is a little like a novel, but also a little much more like a group biography. But a biography, and this is something I'd also like to talk about in Colm's work because he's a biographer as well as a novelist, a biography that takes the biographer's stance as something that's both outside his, his, his subject but also empathizing with it, which is a peculiarly uh, Anglo-American approach to biography. I've, I've discovered over the last few years that biography as most people in this room would read it and analyze it and appreciate it and understand it is something that the British and the Americans do in a way that the French, the Germans, the Spanish don't. And I've gone to, I remember going to a conference once when I'd published the second volume of my Yeats biography and a distinguished Romanian Yeatsian a woman came up to me and said, oh, I, I want to meet you. I've, I've, I've read your biography of Yeats, so I preened myself. And then she said, I want to see this person who spends 18 years trying to be somebody else. <laughs> and I tried to explain that, no, that's not what the biographer does. It's not, it's not what I thought I was doing. But there is an, a simplistic approach to biography, which is that it's all about identification. And there is a different approach, which Colm's new book on Elizabeth Bishop, which I've been reading with great fascination, employs in analyzing her poetry, um, which uses the insights of personal knowledge in a discreet and elusive way to bring about, I think, some particularly blinding insights into the work the person has done. I suppose I tried to write about my people as if I were writing their biographies as, in a sense, creative people, which a great many of them were. Can I, I want to put us on, but just the question of sympathy and, and, and detachment. Because when you do spend so much time with people, and it's a very intimate relationship, you're, you're reading their letters, you're reading their diaries. Uh, and yet, I suppose one of the differences, you know, if Colin's writing a novel about that, he can afford to lose the, the, the detachment from it if he wishes to, whereas yeah. you can't. And I just wonder how you maintain that over such a long period of time, where you're, you're almost being these two people, where you're, you're within their lives, and at the same time you're trying to pattern them and be outside them. I think the point is that you never try to defend them. And I think if you're dealing with a group of people, though it can drive you mad, it's like minding mice at a crossroads, as they say, um, it in a way imposes a kind of uh, valuable distance. If you're saturating yourself in the life of one person and spending decades on it, and if that one person, as with the case of Yeats, is themselves a uh, uh, a highly controversial person, your the temptation is to take the the role of the counsel for the defence, and I think you must never do that. I think that's that's mm. the that's the biographer's besetting sin uh, to write with empathy, but not uh, uh, partial partiality. I suppose, as when Colin was writing about Lady Gregory, I imagine there was you know a lot of Lady Gregory's attitudes. The title you took, Lady Gregory's Toothbrush, came from a particularly snobbish reflection of hers about people who use toothbrushes and people who don't. And I read that when I was reading your book as a kind of manifesto that you are going to keep strictly in view that this was a person whose opinions were not always those that you would yourself endorse. Yeah. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you deal with the same question, Calvin? Because, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm I was suggesting to Roy that there's a difference, you know, and that, that the historian can't afford to lose detachment, but is that maybe also true of the novelist? Um, the, the novel I brought with me is, um, which is the novel that deals, deal, deals most openly with Irish history, is called The Heather Blazing. And it arose first because I wrote a history, I mean, as a journalist, I wrote a you know, very long piece on the Irish Supreme Court, and I had access to some of the judges and I would spend afternoons sitting in the, in the, 
in the chambers of various very conservative figures with whom I had nothing in common, of course, until their good manners emerged and their hospitality. And then they became very interesting. And with, 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 with a number of them, I became intrigued by them as to their own background and how much power they had and um, how badly they used it in certain ways. And then it occurred to me, I know what I can do with this material because the dis that idea of the distance between someone who portrays himself in this way and who someone really is can be handled in a novel in ways where you don't have to, as you say, make judgments or defend. You just have to show somebody, I mean, he's late at night, he's up, and you, um, the whole issue of God is there in the Irish Constitution. The Holy Trinity is mentioned in the preamble, for example, and he's looking at the word God and he suddenly, at, at quite late in the night, just gets the word and crosses it out. And of course, the, he then knows that the only thing he cannot do is use that idea in a judgment. He will remain a conservative man, a supporter of, of um, the establishment, the status quo, but deep within or, or even close within or easy to source within, he's different. I then needed to find a childhood for him. So that was easy. I gave him mine. <laughs> And I then needed, and I'm glad, you know, that I wasn't being analyzed by any Freudian at the time, because he would have stopped writing the novel. I then needed to give him a father, so I gave him mine. <laughs> I needed, obviously needed grandfather, aunts, uncles, mine. I then needed to give him a wife, so I gave him my mother. I, I then needed to give him, you know, summer holidays, I gave him mine. And then in a sort of master stroke, um, I mean, I don't mean this as a, I'm not proud of this master stroke, I, I realized that what I'd always really wanted was to have had no siblings and just, just me, and that I would have sacrificed my mother if my father could have lived longer. So I thought, well, I'd kill her off. So, so in, the, in the book, the little boy who becomes the judge later on just has his father, no, no troublesome siblings, no troublesome mother. Just him and his father getting on really well together, laughing at one another's jokes. And so that, the, the, you know, the, it, the, what happens, what I'm talking about here is getting a, a very, you know, really important public matters, because this judge makes serious judgments um, which affect the society. But what I'm doing is I'm grafting on a set of dreams, imaginings, and memories um, onto this man. So I thought, I mean, when the book was about to come out, they got really concerned about libel. And I said, I will know the person who would most be likely to sue is me, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm really the one whose personal life is most, you know, exposed in this book. And I, I, I'll stand in and then, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll do anything you want, you know. Um, well, would you like to read a piece from Vivid Faces for us? Okay. okay. I'd only like to read two pieces because they link up. This is my account of my favorite. Uh, one quite early on, where I'm assembling, if you like, the class and, and the characters. And I begin with somebody called Mabel O'Connor, who I learned that she's Mabel Fitzgerald. She becomes oddly enough another of the um, future Taoiseach Prime Minister, rather, the Irish Fitzgerald. But we're dealing with her now in our three world. <coughs> Mabel McConnell, a strong-minded and markedly attractive young Northern Protestant in full flight from the bourgeois family, became radicalized at university in Belfast and in London. Okay. Became radicalized um, in college in Belfast and then London. Worked briefly as secretary to George Bernard Shaw and George Moore, and eloped to be on the poet desk with Fitzgerald. She privately reflected, I see now to place all my friendships in nationalism. Other things are far as important, but not nearly as much so. Escape for people like Mabel could be facilitated by foreign travel. Many of the revolutionary generation followed well-established Irish routes to continental Europe for purposes of education, work, leisure, as well as traveling regularly across the Atlantic. Mobility, access to faster and cheaper transport, created new opportunities for evading the world of their parents. Others, such as Rosamond Jacob, questioned the assumptions of their background while still trapped in it. Rosamond was the plain, intense, uncompromising child of free-thinking parents. 
She wrote copious diaries recording her frustration with bourgeois provincial life, a powerful sense of thwarted sexual longing, alienation from both her Quaker background and from the dominant Catholic ethos, and her implacable determination to break into another world. A passionate cult of Irish republicanism and Fenianism provided one route, and the cultural and social sphere opened up by membership of the Gaelic League another. In classic back to the people mode, she recorded her attempts to learn Irish, to seek out like-minded people, and to make the contacts which would bring her from sleepy Waterford, where anything Irish spells disaster, into revolutionary nationalist circles in Dublin and the glamorous ambience of Constance Markovich and Maud Gonn. In this world, she searched for similarly secularist thinkers, though she was often disappointed. Her robust, if rather reductionist, belief that the Catholic Church is one of the greatest influences for evil in the world, and it is incomprehensible how any sane person of any intelligence can be a Catholic, did not always meet with approval among her new nationalist companions. Certainly not among the McSweeney family in Cork, Terence and his sisters Mary and Annie. The fervent devotion of Terence's diaries is exceptional even for the time. He sought advice about the propriety of reading Tolstoy because of the Russians' religious unconventionality and recorded his anxious hopes and speculations as to which of his friends might possibly have a religious vocation. A total abstainer, he avoided mixed company except for patriotic purposes and inveighed against beastly sensual passion. Yet he also believed in the transformative power of radical theater and worshiped Ibsen. A decade later, Terence would become celebrated as a nationalist martyr, dying on hunger strike in 1920. His sisters remained irreconcilable Republicans all their lives, while his widow Muriel, a daughter of the hugely wealthy brewing and distilling Murphy dynasty, followed a yet more radical course, moving to Germany and then France, and embracing communism with all the fervency with which she had espoused Republican nationalism. Her testimony to an American commission on conditions in Ireland in 1920 emphasized her sense of being part of a special generation. My parents are not quite like myself, I am characteristic of a certain section in Ireland. The younger people in Ireland have been thinking in a way some of the older ones have not. They are Republican. I am only characteristic of a great many who were brought up, shut up at home. The large family of Ryan sisters from Tom Coodle, County Wexford, came from a different background from Muriel and stayed close to the parents, but they too struck out a new path. The high-spirited daughters of a strong farmer family which believed fervently in education for girls as well as boys. They traveled abroad, worked as teachers, scientists, and university lecturers, and shared the sense of making a new world. Like many of the revolutionary elite, they'd become radicalized while living and working in England. Yet what linked these disparate people together was Anglophobia. Rosamond Jacob, on visits to England, wrote contemptuously of everything from the landscape to the faces of the people in the street. Dermot Coffey told his girlfriend, Cheska Trench, the point of independence is to be able to hate the English comfortably from a position in which they can't look damned superior and smile. Mabel Fitzgerald, after sojourns in London and Brittany, returned to Ireland and became deeply involved in the separatist cause. She wrote to her ex-employer, George Bernard Shaw, in 1914 from the wilds of County Kerry. Here, she told Shaw, she was bringing up her son to speak Irish and adopt the sound traditional hatred of England and all her ways. You should just hear him say, Sassanac. The concentrated hate in his voice is worthy of Drury Lane. Shaw reposted with an affectionate but hard-hitting reply. As an Ulster woman, my dear Mabel, you must be aware that if you bring up your son to hate anybody except a papist, you will go to hell. You must be a wicked devil to load a child's innocent soul with a burden of old hatreds and rancors that Ireland is sick of. You make that boy a good international socialist, a good Catholic, in fact, in the true sense, and make him understand that the English are far more oppressed than any folk he has ever seen in Ireland by the same forces that have oppressed Ireland in the past. Shaw also told Mabel that he who is master of the English language is master of the world, and jeered that Gaelic, revivalist, Gaelic revivalism is not Irish. It was invented in Bedford Park, West London, a palpable hit at his old adversary, W.B. Yeats. Mabel's sense of the Irish zeitgeist in 1914 was more acute than Shaw's. 
But his accusation that she was a born orange woman who was also a bit of a spoilt beauty and an educated woman trying to live the life of a peasant must have struck home. There is indeed something very narodnik about the life that she and many of the generation of 1916 were trying to lead at the time. As Shaw saw, the revolutionary mindset characteristic of educated and intelligent people repudiating the prejudices of their upbringing required several kinds of repudiation, which might, he warned Mabel, rebound against her when her own son rebelled. Nothing educates a man, he told her, like the desire to free himself by proving that everything his parents say is wrong. So that's 1914, and then briefly, I want to go ahead to the very end of the book where we encounter these people again. And actually, I'll just begin with Liam de Roche, though, whose, whose reflection that he was changing and life around him was changing in 1905 was such a revelation to me. I read through his diaries and discovered he'd annotated them in old age. In reflective and conciliatory mode, Liam de Roche set to editing his youthful diaries in 1943 and was struck by how puritanical he had been when a young revolutionary in pre-1916 Cork. I have grown tolerant, he reflected. The inconsistencies of men no longer trouble me. They only stimulate a sense of humor. Exactly a year later, in 1944, Mabel Fitzgerald wrote once again to her old employer and admirer, George Bernard Shaw. Like the Mulcahys and the McCulloughs, De Desmond and Mabel Fitzgerald had opted for the treaty, in Mabel's case against her will. Desmond's ministerial career in Cum and Gael had not been a conspicuous success, and colleagues like Mulcahy considered him over-intellectual, precious, and out of touch. In the 1930s, he turned back to his first love, philosophy, and the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas. Mabel remained more skeptical. I have, unfortunately, little conscious need of religion, she wrote briskly to her husband's friend, the Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain. I have to make it a matter of a series of efforts. She had also left her revolutionary youth behind her, though her opinions remained as decisive as ever. The Mabel who tried to live like a peasant in Brittany and Kerry, remarked a younger relative, as an older woman terrorized her daughters-in-law with inflexible standards, re-China and bone-handled knives. <laughs> Mabel herself, in this 1944 letter, admitted to Shaw, I've changed my own views greatly since youth. About adult suffrage, for instance, I find the masses always wrong. They seem to stand for the worst in man. Certainly not for integrity, which I put first as the essential virtue in private and public life. I am convinced that education is necessary to the forming of views that are worthwhile at all, and I don't believe the majority of people can take education. If poverty and dirt and disease could be abolished, and I hope they may be, the multitude would still want more dog racing, more drink, more pictures, more tabloid views from the cheap press. Adult suffrage seems to have led only to the supremacy of people without standards and values and of the half-baked educationally. Government and all control will soon be in the hands of the uneducated or the semi-educated. They already dominate everything here, and you seem to be heading for the same situation in England. And aren't they complacent? I don't believe things are any better in Russia. The complacency is there, all right. Shaw, receiving this late letter, must have vividly remembered the spoiled beauty whom he had mocked 30 eventful years before as an educated woman trying to be a peasant. Uh, thank you very much, Roy. Um, it struck me, Colin, uh, Roy mentioned the, the Ryan sisters who, who play a very big part in, in the book and they're kind of they're a fascinating study in themselves. You could almost have written an entire biography of them. But it, it's, it's interesting just in terms of the overlap that uh, in, in your own most recent novel, uh, you have Ryan, who would have been a son of one of those? No, he was brother. a brother. Brother, rather. Sorry, yes, younger brother. Younger brother. All, younger brother. all those sisters, yeah. Jim was the youngest. He was, in the, he was in the general post office in 1916. He was a medical student. I think he was the only person with medical... Um, what, what, is that right, Katrina? That he was the only person with medical experience in, in the GPO in 1916. And... Um, I mean, what happened to a lot of the leaders is, I mean, I think what Roy has been reading now is really interesting as to what happens to a revolutionary generation over time. And that, that idea of Mabel Fitzgerald one moment wanting to change the entire world, and the next moment we wanted to change her daughter-in-law's tableware. 
you just go treatment I, of the table yeah treatment, treatment of treatment of the table where i mean i i have a version of that which is that um you know this this family the ryans they were they were all part of they were the vivid faces they were the ones who wanted to change their own lives how they traveled how they the books they read all, all those things and then take part um in 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 a revolution and they all um did four of them married two of them married sean to kelly who became president of ireland one of them married um, we used to call him dirty dick in our house um, and anyway, when he says two of them married sean to kelly he's not making a mistake there the two of them didn't. i mean they didn't marry him at the same time obviously <laughs> because um we didn't we didn't do bigamy but one of them married a man called dirty dick didn't he who didn't she yeah, he was a leader of the other political party than the one my family adhered to. We called him Dirty Dick. Um, other people called him Rishtard Mulcahy. And then there was a man called McCullough, who was also had been involved with the rebellion. So four of the sisters married within the revolutionary generation. The younger brother, the, the, the only boy in the family, is that right? Uh, no, there were two brothers. Oh, there okay. were three brothers, but one other became a priest and one looked after the farm. Oh, priest, Very farm, priest. right. And anyway... Um, and he eventually became like a good number of the leaders who had survived. He, he almost moved into what we might call a rotten borough in the sense that he was elected but in every election that he ran for, um, as though by right. And um, he was so sure about this that he didn't live in the constituency or ever visited the constituency, um, which was the constituency that I'm from, which, which is Wexford. And my father was his election agent. And, and yeah, he never saw him. And he, but he was fine, he just won every, he, and he became Minister for Finance. He was Minister for Health and then Minister for Finance. But there's a wonderful moment out of the Vivid, where the Vivid faces gathered, gathered together again for a party for the daughter of Jim Ryan called Nula, who gets married in the early 1960s. And they give a party a week before the wedding for their political people, so they can have a more private actual ceremony. And they invite my, my, they invite my parents and another local political couple who drive up from Wexford to this mansion in Delgany, which is closer to Dublin, only to find that the entire revolutionary generation are there in monkey suits, the men, and in evening dress, the women, trying to look like English people. And um, after all the trouble everyone's gone to, this is what it's come down to, the monkey, and the evening dress. And of course, my, no one had told my parents or their two friends, the, the men were sort of raging, thought these people, who do they think they are? But the women, of course, were mortified because they had to go around the whole evening with their ordinary dresses on against the other people. But that's one way that the, you know, the vivid faces ended up, um, you know, I mean, I, th I think that is something that happens to every revolution. It, but yes, it was, it was the, fun watching it happen to the Irish one. It's the unforeseen futures, which is what makes writing history as exciting, if you take to it as writing a novel, that people don't know the future that's going to befall them, but they act as if they did. And it's matching, it's tracing that mismatch between how people act and the expectation of a future that will never happen. You know it won't happen, but they don't. And I mean, that, that's the imaginative yeah. leap, isn't it, for a historian? Because you've got to try to imagine back it to is. a time when people don't know what you know. Yeah. And, that's, that's and why revolutions are so particularly interesting to write. I mean, I'm, I'm reading a very good biography of Napoleon at the moment, the first volume of it. And there's this sort of incident in, in the early 1700s well, actually, the late 1780s, two young Corsican brothers, you know, are stationed near Lyon. They become friends with two girls who are the daughters of the local silk merchant, who is also politically interested. Um, the boys are the Bonaparte brothers, Joseph and Napoleon. The girls are called Juliet and Dizzy O'Hay Clary. You know, the wheel turns round because Napoleon nearly marries one of them, Joseph marries the other. The two girls end up, one is the Queen of Spain and the other is the Queen of Sweden. And Napoleon ends up the emperor of practically Europe at one point. And you think back to the moment when they are meeting, walking out you know, along the canal together, two by two. And it's an extraordinary idea that they didn't know what their future was going to be, but, the, but that you do. Colin, would you read something for us? Sure. Um, Enniscorthy Castle um, was built on the site of a Norman castle. Um, and it, it, was, it was built in the 1580s, and Edmund Spencer spent some time there, not very long, um, certainly Walter Raleigh was there, and some other um, of the Elizabethan poets. It was um, restored by a man called Sir Henry Wallop. My father took against him, I mean, he didn't know him personally, um, I mean, because Henry Wallop had done all this work in the 
1580s and 1590s, but um, he, Henry Wallop did write to the Queen at one point to say that the only thing to be done with the locals, with the natives, was to exterminate the brutes, that there was nothing else that could be done with them, and they were a constant danger, and that they were, they were a dreadful problem. Um, my father and a friend of his, who was a priest, decided um, in the late 1950s, they, they ran dances in a place called the Athenaeum in order to raise money, in order to buy the castle from a family called the Roaches who owned the big maltings and who had restored the castle for domestic use in the 1930s and 40s and then had stopped living there in the 50s, so, so, so it was empty. And they wanted to set, set up the county museum. And so in about 1962, um, things began to arrive for the museum. They let people know that they wanted anything old anyone had, could it bring, it, bring it into the museum. And so people began to come in slightly nervously. And I, I was... Um, seven or eight at the time, and I would go down after school with my father, and we'd wait there, and some restoration work was being done upstairs. But the other thing was happening was there'd be a knock, a tentative knock to the door, and someone would come with a package, and it would be open. And some of those packages, and I saw them, contained pipe, the top part of a pike. Obviously, the wooden part from below had rotted, but the top part, because it was metal, was intact. And they claimed that these were the pikes from 1798 that the rebels had used and that they had held on to them, or they remained in the family all the years. I mean, there always was a joke about that, about any time that there's a ceasefire in Ireland, like the recent IRA one, or the one in the 50s, or the one in, um, at Independence, that the thing to do is to get the pikes and put them up into the thatch, because it'll be useful again for the next time. But, but in any case, um, this, is, this, is, this is an account in the novel of the priest Father Rossiter, the boy and his father, who go out into the countryside um, in search of people who have these um, metal tops for pikes. One evening when the sky was bright, he went in the car with his father and Father Rossiter towards Owlert. They put a notice in the echo asking if anybody had old things in their houses which might be of historical value. People had written to them from all over the county. His father wrote back to each person, putting a tick at the top of each letter he had replied to, then gathering them in a bundle at the back of his scrapbook. A mile before reaching Owlert, they were to turn right, Father Rossiter said. These were his instructions. But he was unsure which turn to take, and they halted at several farmhouses to ask for directions. <coughs> the priest jumping out to be met by a few sheepdogs or a small barking terrier. One woman came out with him to, to, the, to the car, peering in to see who was in the passenger seat and the back seat, her curiosity clear and undisguised. Is it Bill Byrne, she asked. Is he sick? didn't know there was anything wrong with him. Are you sure it's him you're looking for? Father Rossiter was not sure. Are there any other burns in the area? There's, there's Liz Byrne. Is it Liz Byrne you're looking for? The woman asked, squinting her eyes as she looked at him. I know that there's a brother and sister living together, Father Rossiter said. Oh, that's Phil Byrne and May, the woman said. And have you never been up there before, Father? Which turn do I take? Oh, you'll have to turn back now. It's the turn on the left after the crossroads. Will you be around long? No, no, we're just making this one visit, Father Rossiter said, as he got back into the car. After the crossroads, there was a lane to the left, but they did not know if this was the correct turning. They tried the lane, which became increasingly rotted and overgrown, seeming to lead nowhere, and becoming even narrower as they came to a, a brightly painted gate. His father got out and opened it, held it as the car went through, then closed it and got back into the car. Suddenly the lane began to widen again. They reached a clearing, and saw a small farmhouse with a galvanized roof. It's hard to imagine, Father Rossiter said, people living so far from the road. A sheepdog ran out from the house and started to bark at the front wheels of the car. Two old people were now standing at the door. They were both watchful, almost furtive. The woman was wearing a cardigan and had her arms folded. He waited, the boy waited in the car with his father while Father Rossiter went to speak to the couple at the door. They were still unsure whether they were at the right house. Do they have old things, he asked his father. They have pikes from 98, his father said. That's what they said in the letter anyway. Do they find them? Stop asking questions now, his father said. Father Rossiter returned to the car and, and motioned for them to come into the house. The dog had now stopped barking and wagged his tail as they passed. We thought there was something wrong when we saw the priest, the woman said, when they got in, inside the small kitchen, which had a huge blackened fireplace and a table up against the window. We have no tea. We can't get any tea around here at the moment, she went on. Milk is the only thing I can offer you. We have plenty of that, thank God. 
Eamon sat down at beside the window, he's the boy, running his finger along the plastic oil cloth with its pattern of flowers. The woman put a mug of milk in front of him. There were strange web-shaped cracks in the mug, which he inspected before first tasting the warm milk. They came down by here, he heard the man saying to his father and Father Rossiter. No wonder they left whatever they were carrying. Sure, weren't they bet? Didn't the English have muskets? The sheepdog came stealthily into the kitchen and lay in front of the fire, eyes fixed on the man as he spoke, and its head resting on its paws. Suddenly the man shouted at it, and the dog slithered off back to the yard. There were hard times, all right, the woman said. The man went into a room at the side and came back with a wooden pole and two curled metal hooks at the top of it. Father Rossiter and Eamon's father stood up and examined it eagerly. The hooks looked sharp and dangerous. The woods knew I, I did it myself, the man said, but I didn't have to touch the metal. Do you have more of them? Father Rossiter asked. Aye. I have twenty or thirty of them in here, the man said. Our grandmother now, on our mother's side, she was brought up here. It was the time of the evictions. She used to own from here out to the road the whole way, including the two big barley fields. She knew the men of 98. The woman looked into the fire and then back at the two visitors. She would have been too young to remember it, but they told her about it, or she heard about it, and it was she who always said that they came down this way. And that was the end of them then. That's all I remember now. There was a man used to come here and they used to talk about it. The room was filling up with smoke from the fire. Eamon watched a small piece of soot falling slowly through the air and landing on the surface of his warm milk. It had a shape of its own, a curly black shape. He did not want to swallow it. He studied it for a while as the others talked and then put his put his finger into the milk and fished it out. He dried his finger on his trousers, having checked that no one was looking at him. Sure, they're no use to us at all, the man said. We'll be gone soon. Thank you. Um, that, by the way, was from Callum's novel, The Heather Blazing, with uncharacteristic modesty. Callum is, hasn't read from his most recent novel, um, which I think is the first time I've ever come across a novelist who doesn't want to read from their, their, their novel that's just out. Uh, but that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a little bit of time for, for, for questions. Um, I'm sure there's lots of things that you would, you would like to ask uh, either Roy or Callum or, or both. Um, could I just ask two things, please. One is that if you're going to make a statement that you at least try to frame it in the form of a question. Um, and the second is just you can keep it short because that way we can, we can get more people in. There is a, a microphone, so if you wouldn't mind just putting up your hand and then if I point to you, we'll just wait for the microphone to reach you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. A very interesting panel. Um, Colm, I have a question. I've read two of your novels so far and um, I really love them. Uh, that's a statement. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, what, is, what, informs, what informs your insights, which are very psychological? Um, it, it seems to me in both The Master and in Nora Webster, your characters um, have this incredible inner life that is um, very deep uh, and very... Um, very much, um, I think, it seems to me, informed by psychology in some ways. Um, or is this just your own insights? <laughs> I, um, I think there are two things. One of them is that um, with most of the books, I have left a long time between thinking of the book and finishing it, and even between thinking of the book and starting it, so that I've had a long period where almost every day, and it's a real excuse if you want to just lie in bed, or just do nothing at all, just stare. You can always think, no, I'm thinking about my novel. And it's good. And, um, but it means that slowly something is forming. Something, is, something amorphous, something that was barely there, is coming slowly into place. And you're not taking notes, and you're not beginning. You're just, just slowly it's happening in your mind. So that you, you almost have it in full by the time you start. The second thing is that a novel is a, a thousand or two thousand details. And the only thing you have to do then is make sure that the next sentence, or the one you're writing now, or both, are reasonably true and plausible and fit in rhythmically with what's going on. Now, if you do that, you end up in a, in a space where at least 
you know, where you stop thinking about the large picture and you think about the small detail. I mean, I mean just there, the idea of there's a, there's a boy in a room, they're, they're talking history, the men, the adults. And I have to give him something to do. I can't just put in, he found their talk boring and didn't listen much. That's really no help here. I need a thing. And of course, a piece of soot falling. And you don't think of that in advance. As you're working, you think, I need something here just that will almost be a lyrical moment, will take us away from the large subject of history into the tiny moment of poetry, into the tiny thing, the bit of soot falling in, and he's look, looking at it. And then wondering what he'll do, and then putting his finger in. You know, in, in other words, that's, you get that on the moment. But what you've already got before you start is a, 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 at least the boy, and perhaps his father, and the, all the arrangements. So it comes in that way. But psychology is too big a word, an abstract word, to be useful here, in, in the sense that it's, it's much vaguer and harder to just pinpoint or describe. And you often, in a single second, get something that has taken a year, but, but you only realize it in the second, which you've been building towards it, an image or a, or a piece of knowledge. But if you went, I mean, I think if you went and did research within psychiatry or psychology on the background of your characters, it would get you nowhere and perhaps lose you a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have another question, please? Thank you very much. Uh, would you mind just hanging on for one second? We'll just get the microphone to you. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Fintan. Brilliantly chaired, brilliant panelists. Just a question for Roy, if I may, about the, the question of violence uh, and how the revolutionary generations speak to the issue of violence. That's a very deep, short and very deep question. Thank you. Um, there's a very interesting unpublished reflection by one of the wonderful Ryan sisters. who, who when, And she goes and sees Tom Clark, one of the leaders of the Rising, um, the, the evening it's about to happen. And she writes, and she never said this in an interview, but she wrote it down and it was recorded in uh, um, her husband's great collection of memorabilia about the rising. Um, when he said they were all going out to get killed, I got a terrible shock. I somehow had no idea that people would get hurt and thought we would all come out of it all right. Now, this was a woman whose fiance, Sean McDermott, was one of the leaders of the rising. She would go and see him a, a week later in, or a fortnight later in his condemned cell. A heartbreaking description, which is in my book as well. Um, and there's somehow this, it's part of, to do with being very young and thinking you never will die, I think. It's part of the long tradition of the idea of sacrifice and dying for Ireland, which is a trope in Irish historical memory and in Irish nationalist rhetoric, and which I think the more it's repeated, the less the actuality of blood and guts and head split open and um, all the horrors of death become curiously abstract. Um, the, one reason, I think, for the theme of disillusionment, which is quite a large part of my book, there's a long chapter called Remembering, which is about how people feel about it afterwards. One reason for the prominence of this theme of disillusionment is that a, a considerable number of the people I deal with clearly felt afterwards they had taken on more than they had expected to, that things had gone further than they had expected them to, that the reality of death was something that they hadn't figured in to their brave new world, which is in some ways all too human. And of course, when, as many of you here will know, the revolution was followed by a bloody civil war where brother turned on brother and where there was a higher and more traumatic casualty rate than there was in the war against the British forces. Uh, this also added another layer of disillusionment and a repudiation of violence. And when in the 1940s the government decided to start collecting the memories of the revolutionary generation through uh, um, a marvelous institution called the Bureau of Military History where they went around interviewing people, several people refused to give their memories saying they just didn't want to revisit that time. Now, these are a minority. I think for the majority of people, because it was all told, <laughs> a successful revolution and produced a successful state. And for the majority of people involved in it, I think the idea that violence was worth, worth the candle 
was an absolute sine qua non. But there's a significant minority, I think, of those for whom it wasn't. And that is something that we've come more and more to recognize, not just myself and not just this book, but I think that recognition has become part of the more nuanced, skeptical, interrogative way that we've come to see the whole revolutionary period. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, just here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the panel for a very interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, the disappointment and the disillusionment that followed the, the revolution and the failure of the Irish state um, to manage its economic affairs and its economic performance uh, with a continuous economic recession every 25 years. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel um, what their views are on that and why is that an institutional failure? Um, is it failure of strategic leadership? Um, what's their view on the um, poor contemporary um, economic performance of the, the Irish economy over the last period since 1950? Thank you. Oh, no, Tom, you, can, you can start with that. <laughs> I, I'm just I, 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 I think it's, I think it is one for Finn. Finton has written more penetratingly about this than anyone, including, I'm afraid, either Colin Tobin or myself. So I, I think I, it's I his question. Could the uh, lefty speak? I mean, it, it is. It's a, it, it is extraordinary, and uh, I mean, I, I, I hope Roy would take us up. But I mean, the, the lack of economic discussion really in the revolutionary generation is is really quite extraordinary. I mean, there's a little naivete, I suppose, about the fact that. Somehow, once we get rid of the British, we will ha we will be able to produce all our own stuff, and 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 some of, of course, is is you know very very genuine and 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 in essence absolutely right. You know the the the, the notion that you would have an Irish economy which works for itself, um, but of course, I suppose the primary reason why it's never addressed is is mass immigration. You know that that mass immigration really is the economic original sin. And of course, it precedes the state, and the state does nothing about it. I mean, it, it, it really has no effect on it whatsoever. The only time emigration stops is when the, the big emigration markets are not available, particularly when the United States, of course, during the, the Depression, uh, you know, the, the, then the, that, that doesn't become as, 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 uh, as obvious a route, and but then people go to Britain. Um, and, you know, the dwindling of the population is just something that you can't leave out. It is, it is unique. Uh, in, and I don't want to say, and I think Roy was right, it's a very successful state in some ways, but it's not a successful state in one of the most really fundamental aspects of how you judge a success, which is demographics. You know, there are fewer people in the 26 counties in uh, 1960 than there were in 1922 when the state was set up. Um, by by 19, 1960, the state doesn't look viable demographically. You know, there's, 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 it's, it's fallen well below three, 3 million people. The marriage rate is the lowest in the developed world. Uh, people aren't getting married, you know. It's, uh, and then, of course, you have to have this, this enormous change in 1958. But the change in 1958 is really the only thing you could possibly do, which is which is really to say, look, we've effectively we failed, and we have to give over our development to somebody else, which is which is multinational capital. And I don't think anybody would say that that wasn't the best of the available options at the time. But it's still not a great option because, yes, of course, it has enormous positive spin-off, but it still means you're still left with the problem. And to this day, there's still not an, an indigenous, creative, industrial base outside of the, the multinational corporations in Ireland. And so most of the expertise, most of the skill, most of the developmental energy is still going into these, these enormous transnational corporations. Um, whose relationship with Ireland is, is, is ambiguous. It's a very positive one in some ways, but also, of course, it's a, it's a very negative one in other ways because a lot of it is, is, is based around tax avoidance. If I was an American citizen, I would feel pretty bad about the fact that uh, Google doesn't want to pay any tax in America and, and, and uses Ireland to, 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 to avoid it. So as a long-term strategy, it's, it's, it's not one, I think, that's going to lead you to long-term development. And then what you get, of course, in the absence of your own organic long-term development, the kind of stuff that the revolutionary generation dreamed might happen, if you don't have that, what do you get? Well, then you get obsessional interest in aspects of the economy that are really no use, which is what we saw during the Celtic Tiger years. You know? So what, what, what do you do when you've got all this energy 
money floating around? Do you put it in to try to develop a new product, into trying to develop a new kind of service? No, you put it into land, you put it into housing, as, as if it was 1560. You know, uh, you're, the, 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 the attitude towards what, what is economic wealth is still actually in some ways incredibly undeveloped. And this doesn't mean that they're not fantastic businesses or, or wonderful people trying to, trying to do really interesting things in the economy, but they remain very, very small because they're always in the shadow of, of, of the multinational sector. And most state policy still goes towards that multinational sector. And we've never figured out a way of, of thinking about how we get beyond that. Um, if the world gets serious about tax avoidance, you know, the Irish economy could be in really serious trouble. Because um, if that's your big selling point, um, it's, it's not one I'd like to bet on for the next 30 or 40 years. Um, and the good thing about this is we just have to think of something else. And I think we're perfectly capable of thinking of something else. I think Ireland still has enormous economic potential. It's because of where it is, because of its very, very skilled um, workforce, great productivity. Um, one of the things the Irish state's done really, really well is education. I'm not saying our education system is great, but we've, we've educated a lot of people. Um, the proportion of people who have third level education in Ireland is really quite outstanding. Uh, and you know, so the, the potential is, is, is really there. If you can stop emigration, if you can, if you can deal with what your relationship to the multinational companies is, and if you can think long term about how you actually develop the social sides of an economy, um, then we can do it really well. <laughs> Sorry about that long rant. Um, uh, do you want to add anything nope. to that, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I wasn't meant to be doing that. Anyway, um, any, would anybody else like to ask a question? I promise I won't rant, uh, and I'll put it back. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, recently, I read Heather Blazing and uh, was completely um, engaged with it and loved the parallel of that, so the, the two different, the stories of the one man as a boy and as a man. One of the things that was really unique for me, and I wondered if this was you designed this and thought of it beforehand, or it just occurred to you, is how just a few times his wife and his family attacked him for being disengaged and cold. And my experience as the reader, it felt like what I imagined he felt. I was shocked. And part of the thing that it made me think about was how things, sort of central things, don't always get expressed. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think there is a sort of method there, or at least a design, which is simply that, um, um, although the novel is set in, with two timelines, you know, that, that, he's, that for every other chapter he's an adult, um, it's every single thing is told from his point of view. So you could, you could call that third person intimate. And if you can hold the reader with it, that no matter what is noticed, it's noticed by him, felt by him, remembered by him, seen by him. The, the theory of this is that the reader slowly becomes him, which is not true if it's told in the first person singular, where his otherness is what's on display. But if it's told he, 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 or using his name, and that only, with no deviation, I think if you m move out of it once, like glass would break, you stay in it. And after a certain number of pages, if somebody, as you say, accuses him of something, the reader actually feels protective of him, despite the fact the accusation is probably correct when you go and think about it. But you're not meant to think about it. You're meant to feel that you're him. And so, I mean, I'm glad that's happened because that was the idea. I sat home trying to do this when I could have been out having a good time. And uh, so it's, you know, but that, but that is the idea. And uh, I suppose it was something that was perfected by Henry James, but it really goes right through. I mean, I mean, you find it in Jane Austen, you find it in George Eliot, and, and, and it's, 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 it's something that is still a tool you can use in fiction that can actually cause something to happen that's not, you're not being told about, but it's actually slowly sort of creeping up on you emotionally. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we could take maybe two more questions. Uh, if, if you have two more questions, yes, thank you very much. So, would you mind just waiting for just one moment, please? We'll, we'll be, have the microphone with you. <laughs> thank you. I have you. a question about Nora Webster, which I haven't finished. I'm about halfway through. And you've probably been asked this question before, so pardon me. Uh, 
what possessed you to write um, as a man, a woman, a character, uh, the main character of your novel uh, in a woman's voice? So I, I apologize if you've been asked this many times. Um, but I'm curious. <laughs> I have been circling that story for 30 years. I mean, the Heather Blazing partly does it. It's the same house as the Heather Blazing. Um, some of the same configurations. And, I, and so I had done it from the child's point of view, having, having changed some essentials. And I realized that I couldn't do that again because with what I wanted to do now, I needed the person to notice more and feel more and to operate from a, a more complete personality so that certain things could be observed and more than that, certain things could be both felt and cast aside almost in the same second, or the same feeling could include its opposite, no feeling. And the only way I could do that was by writing from the mother's point of view. And I didn't worry about that because I was in that house in those years, and I noticed her, meaning my mother, much more than I noticed myself. I had no real idea what I was feeling. I wasn't feeling much, or at least I was pretty, became pretty skilled at disguising feeling or not having. But I saw her, I watched her, everything she did, I watched, and I knew. And I knew what was going on within, even when nothing was being said, or maybe especially when nothing was being said. So, I mean, it, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it, it, the, every detail of that book is taken from some observation or other, and then with some imagination added when I needed something extra, because, of course, life, what you remember, has a odd thinness, or lack of arc, and you need that in a novel, you need something. So I added various things when I felt I needed them. But um, I didn't worry. I didn't worry about, you know, I'm a man, she's a woman. How could I was there. I watched her. And, and there's quite a lot left out in when she closes her bedroom door, as it were. We don't follow her much into very, very personal matters. For example, sexual matters, anything like that. Because I, I didn't feel entitled to do that. But what she said, or what she didn't say, or what she felt about certain things, I did feel entitled to both um, describe and imagine. Could I just pick up on that for a sec, um, Roy, because uh, since Colin raised the issue of following into the bedroom door um, and sex, one of the astonishing achievements of Roy's book is it actually managed, because you never would have thought it possible to write a kind of sexual history of that generation since it's so intimate and private. Uh, and this is not a generation that, that wrote you know, steamy memoirs. Um, and I just wondered how you managed to do that, how you managed to get a sense of their sexual longings and desires, and in some cases, even of their sexual lives. Well, actually, the, the piece I was going to write was all, of, to, to read to you was all about that, but I didn't want to lower the tone, so I, and also it might make you want to actually read the book, um, not having had it already. There are um, lots of dirty bits, by the way, it's really worth reading that's, for that. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to put across. Um, there was one wonderful diary of Dor Rosamond Jacob, whom I mentioned there, and the way that she um, recorded conversations with friends was extraordinarily frank, especially with women friends, about their marriages. Uh, she is endlessly curious about their marriages. So she's not herself married. She doesn't have a fully realized affair with a, with a man until she's in her 40s, which she describes in unflinching detail in her diaries, it hurt like hell is one of the sentences. You know, this is intimate stuff, confided to a special volume of her, of her diary at the end. But not only did I read her reflections on what it was like to be her, I read her rec record of her conversations with her friends. And so that sent me to their letters and to their lives. And I also discovered that through her friend, a fellow Sinn Féiner, she was reading Freud, and she was reading Havelock Ellis, she was reading Geddes, she was reading in the, in the, after 1911 when the psychopathology of everyday life was, was, was translated into English, she, she was reading it. Before the rising, she was reading Freud. And this gave me a very different angle on these people. And she, was, and she said, Ned Stevens, who has lent me this book, is driving all our fellow Sinn Feiners mad because he tells them what their dreams mean. And this was an extraordinary idea that the people whom I, and I expect Colm, had learned about in history as these noble, sainted, sacrificial, pre-Freudian uh, uh, <laughs> pre and completely sexless people were actually young people with sex lives. And so this, there's a chapter in the book called Loving which is, is all about that. There was also, of course, the extraordinary source of Roger Casement's diary, 
which we tend to, Roger Casement was a revolutionary hero who had been a great crusading humanitarian in, 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 in Africa and South America, um, and became an Irish nationalist and tried to bring the Germans in on the side of the rebels and was hanged for treason. But he was also a very uh, committed, uh, cruising gay man who kept an extraordinarily detailed diary, which the pietistic uh, uh, tradition in Irish nationalism could only believe had to be forged, though any forger who could have managed to produce that diary deserves immense credit, I think. But it is, apart from being a very valuable uh, reflection of his life for any biographer, and the latest biography uses it very well, it is also a fascinating uh, record of outlawed sexual activity in the early years of the 20th century, and also of the attitudes, his attitudes towards the men and boys with whom he has relationships. So the stuff is there, and one reason why I think it was there to be exploited very, I think, advantageously and richly, was that that was not an aspect of these people's lives that was ever considered proper to explore before. And I don't think I've been prurient in exploring it, but I think it's a necessary aspect of the lives of the young and of the lives of young people who want to change the world. They're the generation of Edward Carpenter in England. They're suffragettes. They, um, there are m many uh, female relationships in this generation which are clearly partnerships and which are recognized as such. And again, this is what you find from diaries and letters. So to go back to the, the, the actual voices of the people themselves, read until you hear the people speaking is what a great historian said, which actually reflects, I guess, on the way you, you produce a convincing novel as well. I, I mean, I think this is really important if you're gay in Ireland, where it, it is as though uh, up to a certain period that every gay person was left out of everything. You know, in other words, that the fact that Patrick Pierce, who led the rebellion, may have been homosexual, was always considered a sort of aberration, something unmentionable. Or if you mention it, it would be a way of annoying your nationalist friends. And you'd read his poetry about how much he wanted to kiss a little boy. You'd go, look, he wanted to kiss little boys, your leader. And similarly with Casement, you know, in, in, in other words, these people seemed like aberrations. But in, in, in reading your book, what's, what's interesting is to say that perhaps it was their very homosexuality that led them towards revolution. And that, and, the, and, and that there is a seamlessness in the way they approach newness, in the creation of a new identity or a new life for themselves when there wasn't one before, that out, out of darkness came this, this new way of being um, that, that Pierce could write about his homosexuality, even however veiled or sometimes outrageously clear, and the casement could keep his diaries. And that this was actually a part of a revolutionary spirit rather than fully separate from it. And, 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 I, and I think that means that when um, Ireland takes its place among the nations of the earth um, on the 22nd of, um, 22nd of May, um, which when the gay marriage vote takes place, that we'll be able to say, well, actually, that this is a good, you know, that building up to the, um, to the 1916, you know, that, there, that there, is, there is an odd connection between various types of revolutionary activity, um, however covert one of them was. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we're going to have to draw this bit of it to a close. Um, I, I don't know how that's about you, but I, I, I had a great time. I really found it absolutely fascinating. And I, I think what was so fascinating was that you got a sense of um, two processes working almost in different directions with uh, where Colin was talking about that beautiful image of the soot in the boy's um, milk and the men talking about the history and it almost uh, moving away from the big history down into the tiny little detail. And Roy almost building it in the opposite direction, building it from the tiny detail, the tiny intimacies of people's lives into a large pattern history. And um, these two processes, of course, if one is moving upwards and one is moving downwards, they, they meet beautifully in the middle in an imaginative sphere, which is, which, is, which is really something that reproduces the way life is, that people are not just a set of historical facts or political facts or economic facts, but they're also a set of, of imaginative facts, of desires, of dreams, um, of aspirations, um, of... of uh, foolishness of all of those kinds of things. And that, that's, that's really, I think, the, the texture that we get. And it's why I think we need to read both history and fiction in order to understand ourselves, in order to understand our country. Um, and, and I can think of no um, better um, exemplars of, of, of both of these arts than, 
and, and Count Tavane and, and Roy Foster, and on your behalf, I'd just like to thank them for their wonderful eloquence and generosity this evening. Thank you. I, I just forgot to say that both Colm and Roy will be signing books, uh, and uh, I can heartily recommend um, all of the books out on the table there. Thank you.